you can start if you want, Arthur. Oh, I'm 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 on on. Okay. Can I can I share my I, screen? I'm sorry. I was waiting for I, you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry, I just I blanked out for a bit. Um, yeah, yeah, not a problem. I'll, I'll introduce you <laughs> quickly. <Okay. laughs> um, so, welcome to you. Um, the fifth of the Africana um, philosophy lectures. Today, um, we're very lucky to have um, Professor Curry from um, the University of Edinburgh, who's going to be talking about Africana philosophy as a decolonial method. Um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, ma'am. Uh, did everyone enjoy the readings? Yes, no, maybe a little bit. Isn't that? Oh, I'm sorry. I can't share my screen. Can I? Can I get a screen sharing privilege, please? Yeah, sorry. I might have to go change that in a second. Sorry. No, it's fine. It's fine. I'm not entirely sure how I'm supposed to do this. Anyone have any <laughs> insights on? Um, Can you okay. make me? Um, oh yeah, okay. I think I've co-host or yeah. I think you should be able to share now. Sorry. Okay, see. That was yes, that's right. there. We go. Excellent. Can everyone see that? Yes. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. All right. I don't know. Oh. I don't know why that happens, but there, so you know my name. All right. Uh, so yes, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to give the lecture. Uh, I'm gonna speak briefly about Africana philosophy as a decolonial method. Uh, the, the, re the reason I sent you the pieces I did was because they explain a certain conceptualization of Africana thought that I don't think is very widely represented in how we think about racism and blackness. Africana philosophy often is framed as a add-on or polemical stance concerning its relationship to European thought. What I mean by that is Africana philosophy is understood as a kind of rhetoric or intervention by many people in the discipline that points out what European philosophy lacks, but does not have a different methodology or positive program to come up with philosophical insights or analysis on its own. Uh, so many people who do Africana philosophy frame Africana thought as a reflection of engaging problems of race or problems of blackness with European tools. I am not one of those people. Uh, I think that Africana philosophy stands on its own. Uh, it manifests positive attributes or claims about the world from the perspective of blackness, and it fractures or ruptures the kinds of categories like gender, uh, class, et cetera, that are presumed to be universal and able to comprehend or include everyone. So that being said, uh, I want to give you a definition of Africana philosophy. Uh, in my own work, I've defined Africana philosophy uh, to reference any number of perspectives, critiques, and political theories concerning the life experiences and historical struggles of Black people, the descendants of Africa. Africana philosophy is a diverse field of thinking, vastly interdisciplinary, <clears throat> and at its very best is able to synthesize the findings of multiple empirical fields like history or sociology into explanative theories. Uh, this aspect of Africana philosophy is very important. Again, moving outside of the frame that Africana philosophy is simply polemical, but that it actually explains various forces or kinds of entities in the world is an ex extremely important distinction for me and my work. Now, some may ask then, well, what's decolonization? And I've heard so many different arguments about what decolonialism is since I've gotten to this country. So I want to give a simple and clear definition that I think has been well accepted in black studies for the last 30 years in the United States. So decolonization is the process by which the oppressed group, not the white liberals, but the oppressed group 
begins to determine its own destiny and run its own affairs. A genuine decolonization effort requires breaking the psychological, cultural, political, and economic shackles of the old order. For someone like rival state Robert Staples, this was an empirical question. The question that you ask before decolonization is, who has the power to determine? The question you ask after decolonization as a process is, who now has the power to determine? Those should be two different groups of people if decolonization has genuinely occurred. Now, the reason that I wanted to start off with uh, Winter's arguments on mistaking the map for the territory is that I think it gives us an interesting relationship to what we're actually fighting for as intellectuals dealing with problems of race and being. Far too often we think that our job as Black philosophers or people working in Africana is to expand categories of inclusion. And I'll give you a very clear example of that. We think the idea of gender is to expand it to include Black women. We think the idea of the white worker under a Marxist class analysis is to expand it to include the Black worker. We think the notion of uh, dealing with the problem of the human is to expand the humanity of, of uh, those who are oppressed so that they fit within the category of human. They're recognized as human. Um, I argue that this is flawed. The problem is the initial category itself, the incongruence this category has with uh, speaking to describing and, and actually being able to account for the world that oppressed black people live. Winter takes this up as a form of a fallacy. So Winter frames her work uh, on the reification fallacy, which is also called the map, mistake of the math for the territory fallacy. And what it is is a logical fallacy which presumes that the abstractions of a thing can be understood as the real thing. This idea motivates Winter to not mistake the categories of thought presented by the West as actual forms and modes of being. Um, they're, they're just aspects of Blackness. Um, so what she's trying to say is, if you start with the idea of the human, and you think that race, class, gender, ideology, etc., all grow from that anthropology, the idea is not to assume that the issue that you're facing, like whiteness, um, actually represents the biocentric notion of the human that you start with. These are accidents to the human. These are produced by the human. They're culture inventions of it. These abstractions do not determine how we actually refute or contradict the idea of Western man. So part, part of what Winter's interested in doing is, is understanding how our conceptualizations of the world are driven by the actual change in the world. So she wants us to think about the project for black studies in this vein, that our attempt to create new studies, our articulate new genres, our kinds of being are fundamentally related to the world outside of us. So this is why she says that the ability of black people to engage in study was linked to the innovation of blackness through art and protest. She says that the emergence of the Black Studies movement in its original thrust before its later co-optation into the mainstream of the very order of knowledge whose truth in some abstract sense it had arisen to contest was inseparable from the parallel emergence of the Black aesthetic and Black arts movements and the central reinforcing relationship that had come to coexist between them. Now, Winter is trying to give us an idea of how Black Studies was trying to reformulate our set orders of knowledge, how it was trying to give us a different view of humanity that did not try to simply assimilate into white culture. And what I mean by that is when you think about other movements of classism or gender coming from the Western perspective, you're thinking about gender gaining equality with the white man. You're thinking about class, the poor gaining equality with the rich. These do not disrupt the position that creates the disparity or the hierarchy. The rich is still the rich, even if there's a more egalitarian relationship. The man is still a man, just the white female now mimics this order of being. This is what Winter is trying to uproot. She's trying to get us to think outside of this box. My own work is trying to do the same thing. This is why I'm so opposed to reading Black people or Black subjects as objects of white thought. If we take the assumption that, for example, psychoanalysis can be utilized to study, study Black people, is there a moment of self-alienation there? Freud and Totem and Taboo suggest that it's the native that comes to represent the id. It's the practices of quote-unquote primitive people that he thinks is within all of us through evolution, right? Our psyche has developed with this. Well, what happens when you place that inside of a Black mind? Does the black mind reject itself? Does it try to retreat from its own instincts? This is a different form of alienation that Freud did not anticipate. 
because the idea of the id that's controlled by civilization and the ego and the superego is in fact the confining of the racial savage for the black person this is internalized self-hatred this is a rejection of the history of what it means to be black at a psychoanalytic level where the unconscious could never come to bear on the self because the unconscious would overdetermine the self as being a non-object so or a non-entity i'm sorry it is an object not a non-entity so winter takes us through what she thinks actually destroyed the ability of black studies to formulate alternative forms of genre or being she says the first issue was, of course, the incorporation of the black middle class and socially mobile lower middle classes into the horizon of expectation of the generic white middle classes, if still at a secondary level, ending with the separation of their integration as goals from the still ongoing struggles of the black lower and underclasses. The second thing she thinks stopped us from being able to develop new systems of being was the defection of the most creatively original practitioner of black arts movement, uh, Amiri Baraka and his conversion from black power nationalism uh, to the Maoist wing of Marxist Leninism as a universalist counter to the universalism of liberalism. And the third thing was the rise of black feminist thought and fiction, which took as one of their major targets the male and macho hegemonic aspects of the black nationalist aesthetic and its correlated, its correlated black arts movement. Now, Winter continues that the ability of black people to be free actually resides in creating new genres of being. And this is something that I think uh, has great import to how we think about problems. Um, Winter takes her target of thought to be what we call the human. For her, the human is a biocentric concept of Western man. And that doesn't just mean the heterosexual white man. She thinks all forms of philosophical anthropology represent the human. So... <clears throat> What she's arguing, what she argues then is that the human is just simply a particular cultural creation of what Europe believed the human to be, a universalization of the European ethno class of man. Now, through winter, she thinks there are two primary modes by which man existed. From the uh, 16th to 18th century, the notion of man was um, primarily um, secular, right? Man one, man one is a view of man that's trying to deal with various problems of reason from the Renaissance, uh, religion, etc. Uh, man too, however, is dealing with economic man, neoliberal kinds of thought. And she thinks these two forms of these two forms of the human, right? The political man from the Renaissance or man one and the kind of neoliberal economic man in man two uh, set forth the different kinds of expressions that European humanity has had as its apex of civilization. The political man creates different forms or groups of people that are not human, that are to be ruled politically. This would be indigenous people or enslaved Africans. The economic mode of man thinks that the highest forms of civilization is in the transaction and exploitation of different forms of body as labor, as labor or commodity. Uh, these two expressions of the European ethno class then determine how others will not only be defined, but be used. So this is why Winter says that the modes of being that, pro that produce that are bourgeois, worker and feminist are merely aspects of the creations of a particular notion of the human and non-human created by the Western perspective of who should be others. So if you have any of these notions of man, of the biocentric notion of the human, it produces others that negate itself, that are outside of itself. And the problem is we've thought that the object of thought should be to grasp onto those categories and fight to be included back into the notion of the human. She believes this is a mistake. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, so the task then set forth for decolonization um, then is a problem of thought or consciousness for winter and the social hierarchies which structure and produce social beings. Right. So decolonization then is not merely the inclusion of various groups of people under certain systems or institutions of thought and governance. It is quite the opposite It is the uprooting of the structure itself a fundamental reformulation of how we think about different apparatus expressing forms of being. She articulates this as sociogeny or the sociogenetic principle in other writings. So our present criticisms of being aim to remedy the exclusion produced by the human. 
Our attempts to revalorize blackness failed to get at the philosophical anthropology, generating the negation of black people, or what Winter says is the biocentric construction of Western white human. Uh, this forces us to think more expansively about the problem of being behind the category of blackness as othered, where blackness is the one other produced whose task is thought to be rejoining itself with humanity or whiteness. And according to Winter, as a correlative, uh, correlatively, are all the other isms issues that spontaneously erupt in the United States in the wake of the Black social liberation movement, all themselves, like the major isms of class also, specific maps to a single territory, that of the instituting of our present ethnoclass or Western bourgeois genre of the human. Now, this sets forth a different problem by which Africana philosophy has to engage. When we talk about the process of doing philosophical work, we're not again just trying to invalidate the universalism of white constructs. So if we point out that certain authors, certain concepts, certain beliefs uh, entail anti-Blackness, that's not simply to be included within the, the, the parameters of this kind of thought. Uh, it's to show the inapplicability of the thought, how the conceptualization itself is incongruent, doesn't fit with the way that we're trying to explain Black life. Some people have done this under existential phenomenology. Others have taken this question up uh, as a process of Black being or Blackness. Other people in Afro-pessimism have rejected ontology altogether, suggesting that the very framework or metaphysics which undergird the idea of the human and white being uh, simply re reduce black people down to the slave. The point is, is that there has been various attempts to disengage with the anthropological assumptions of what makes the human white and Western. And in order to deconstruct that, various other forms of thought have emerged. So Winter thinks that all of these systems of, of resistance and revolt um, have, have been a demand for psychic liberation. She writes, if therefore it is the very institutionalized production and reproduction of our present hegemonic sociogenic code that calls for the systematic inducing of black self alienation, together with the securing of the correlated powerlessness of its African descended population group at all levels of our contemporary global order, our system ensemble, then the explosive psycho emancipation experienced by black people in the United States and elsewhere can be seen in terms that explain the powerful emotional influence of the three movements that arose out of the social political black movements of the 1960s, the black aesthetic, the black arts, the black studies movements in their original conception. With this experience coming into and in only with their subsequent erasure and displacement. So Winter is suggesting to us that the, the sociogenic code, which is how the entities of the society have been assimilated into Black bodies and then produce a crisis of consciousness where Black people have to see themselves through the lens of negation or through anti-Blackness is part of how racist societies operate. The task then for Africana philosophy and decolonization is not simply the refutation of the negative theories that sustain anti-Blackness in the world, but it takes upon itself the raw problem of consciousness. And this is something that we see articulated throughout the centuries, not only with the freedom that Black people fought for the Haitian Revolution or the work of Du Bois where he's refuting the ethnological tropes of Black inferiority or in the 20th century where we actually fight for political liberation, what we see is the constant problem of a Black studies and an Africana philosophy has been the theoretical undergirding of the way to see the world and the self, to see that there is positive value in Blackness, not only at the descriptive level, but thinking through Blackness as a concept and entity producing worldview, right? This is what Winters set, Winter sets out as her primary subject. But the previous movement affected the map and not the territory. <clears throat> so when we've practiced interventions in the past, trying to integrate ourselves into more human forms of description, we've sought to eliminate race. We've sought to reform race. We've appealed to humanity. We've appealed to freedom. We've appealed to equality. These notions are at best temporarily lived, especially if you follow the work of someone like Derek Bell. Um, she argues that we've gotten some form of, a, we have a need for psychic emancipation, but it hasn't been able to transform the world before us. She writes, given that while the psychic emancipation that these movements uh, 
revalorization of the characteristics of blackness had affected was an emancipation from the psychic dictates of our present sociogenic code, our genre of being human and therefore the unbearable wrongness of being, which it imposed upon all black peoples and to a somewhat lesser degree on all non-white peoples as an imperative function of its enactment as such a mode of being. This emancipation had been affected at the level of the map, right? The abstractions that come to represent the human rather than at the level of the territory. Right. So again, something that's much more structural, that's much more sociogenic, that deals with the very production of the inferior entity is what Winter is is is, is going after. So the place of blackness then uh, in philosophy proper has always been a concern. Uh, this quote is from a good uh, friend of mine, a mentor, uh, Lucius Outlaw. And what Lucius Outlaw wants to think about is the place and relationship that blackness has to academic or disciplinary philosophy. Now, back in the 1970s, uh, you know, I always, always make fun of Lou because uh, he's an older man now. Uh, he was really radical. And he was radical in the sense that he was suggesting that we have to make structural adjustments to how philosophy understands and deals with black people as well as conceptual adjustments in terms of how we define blackness so that it's still connected to black folk and doesn't try to join a bourgeois class of academics. He writes, we black folk must first of all be clear as to our own being, not only individually, but most importantly, collectively. Our being must be viewed in its historical sweep, its cultural, social, political, economic complexities, its future possibilities. Our reflections on our future possibilities as a people must be particularly insightful. The achievement of a seemingly integrated position within the ranks of professional academic philosophers and teachers of philosophy must not leave us blind to the generalized condition of Black people in this country and elsewhere, and most importantly, to the realities of the basis of political economic power in this country in various groupings. Such power concentrations are not sufficiently grasped by traditional theory regarding the class structure of capitalistic society. An appropriate grasp of the situation must in turn be reflected in our struggles to come to grips with the activities which constitute philosophy, end quote. So Africana philosophy for, for outlaw or black philosophy uh, takes as its primary subject of inquiry, uh, what does the work to be the collectivity of black people? Now, at a certain level, this is certainly existential and phenomenological. He's interested in how Black experience intervenes into the dominant theories or modes of, or, uh, of being in categories presented as academic philosophy. So here throughout, um, he makes an argument about how certain categories given to us by white academic philosophy cannot accurately capture the experiences or explain the realities that Black people live within. However, he also makes another point. He says that it's our reflection, right? The reflection that Black people have to deal with themselves that place Blackness within itself as an object of study. Said differently, if we understand that the European Academy views Black people as objects and determines what Black people are based on their perception of Black culture, what then is the role of Black philosophers to study Blackness? What tools, interpretation, what decisions and reflections do we utilize to study ourselves? This is the reflective aspect of Black philosophy that is drawn out in the sociogenetic principle that Winters presents us in. If the crisis of Black consciousness is always going to be imperiled by anti-Blackness, then the question is how does Black philosophy deal with the problem of its own consciousness and being? Various forms of this question has been asked. In my own work on dialect and method, I look at this as a cultural logical question. What do I mean by that? Well, the way that we incentivize Black philosophers to do philosophy is very much driven by the interests that white people have in organizing the discipline. When we talk about the kinds of philosophy that's accepted and deemed philosophical, the kinds of Black authors, our kinds of works that are deemed philosophical, we're making decisions based on how those works fit within a larger liberal and integrationist paradigm. So Black authors who champion revolt, violence, separatism, et cetera, pan-Africanism, are not seen as the proper philosophical characters of reflection. They're arguments and writings are not taken seriously as philosophical endeavors because they don't seek to work within the kinds of anthropological assumptions that sustain re reason, liberalism, et cetera. But the theories that do get accepted then become idols, so to speak. 
and in fact leads us to misread many of the historical tomes that Black people write. For example, when we study W.E.B. Du Bois, we read him as if he's participating in conversations with white thinkers like Hegel. We pretend that he's working with William James. We assume that he's integrationist and wants a richer and more expansive notion of democracy. We ignore that his last books, for instance, suggested that America was a colony, American democracy was, was unworkable, and white people are the most deceitful people on the face of the earth that all history has shown. Now, what's the reason for us extricating those kinds of views of Du Bois from his own work, despite that, that being the culmination of his research? The reason that we're willing to do this is because the apparatus of political thought that, that we are dealing with shows us that the Black people, the Black thinking and theories that we use to explain Black existence have to be accounted for within a certain system. I remind you again, this is exactly what Winter is arguing against when she's talking about the genre and the isms that formulate Western man. If we look at the culmination of descriptions and governance, liberalism, capitalism, et cetera, and we bring Black thought into that as an assimilation to these larger categories, we're missing the positive function that Africana thinking and Black history and experience is brought to the fore. It is simply false that Black people thought that the dominant mode of engaging white oppressors was assimilation into oppressive societies. So the question has to be asked, what kinds of societies, what kinds of values, what aspects of liberation did Black people create for themselves? And if they created these values, what were the obstacles that forgot or didn't allow those things to be realized as social programs? This is the question that I'm asking normatively of disciplinarity. Why is it that certain radical forms of Black experience are shut out? This question was taken up by E. Franklin Frazier, because Frazier said that when you think about the intellectuals of Africa, they begin with where the concept or the question of what has colonialism done to our culture? But when you look at the phrasings or the questions being asked in America, it's a question of how does the discrimination that I face as a black person prevent me from being equal to that of a white person? Fraser says these are two fundamentally different questions. That one of the weaknesses of black philosophy coming out of the 1960s and 70s was its inability to articulate positive values of black people that arose from its folklore, its experiences, its tales, and its, its history. But he said we could find any black person who studied formal philosophy tell you all forms of civilization and triumphs of white society. His comment sounds very reminiscent of Carter G. Woodson's argument in the miseducation of the Negro, where we have an idea of education and theory that inculcates into the black mind a view of itself that doesn't fit. What I mean by that is we learn from the best institutions in the world from of the world that black people lack civilization, black history, have produced no text of philosophy. And we seek to remedy this by designating certain texts as being philosophically worthy of study within these white institutions. That does not tell us the genealogy of thought that black people had. We're not bringing into the fold the kinds of debates that you're getting from Steve Biko and Frantz Fanon. We're not looking at the intellectual genealogy between people like W.E.B. Du Bois, William H. Ferris, and Kelly Miller. The reason we don't do that is because those genealogical trends of argumentation suggest that Black people are not relying, allowing and relying on the anthropological assumptions of white endeavors. And that's what ends up becoming the crisis of how we think about Black thought. Do we choose a political motif of integration that guides our ethical, political, and conceptual concerns? Or do we, as Fanon, as Winter, as Du Bois suggests, invent fields of Black studies and new concepts that can capture the experience of Black people, quite separate from the kind of disciplinary apparatus that we see throughout the university? Um, I'll end with, uh, I don't know how much time I have left, but I'll, I'll end with um, a very brief account of Necro being from uh, Leonard Harris. And the reason that I, I gave that article is because I think it suggests to us that we have to stop looking at racism as an accident of social organization. Uh, the culmination of the disregard, the dehumanization, or what Winter has called the disbeing of Black people, um, manifests itself in social and political uh, dehumanization. Uh, Harris suggests to us that when we're looking at necro being, we're discussing a type of black being that was invented in the West that allows disposability, that is non-humanity put into practice. And I think that Africana philosophy has done two things. It's correctly illuminated 
that this dynamic exists throughout our societies, be it in the United States, the UK, et cetera, that there's a dehumanization, a devaluing of blackness, right? Even within various countries in Africa. On the other hand, it also illuminates that none of the normative processes or theories that we've introduced to deal with that problem have been serious enough to actually grasp the reality of black death. So Necrobeing for Harris stands in as the collective black problem that was mentioned decades ago by Lucia's outlaw. How do we both rethink ourselves under the tremendous force of violence that constantly extinguishes black life? So on two different fronts, I think Africana philosophy um, manifests itself both as a, as a problem of history, right? How we understand blackness and what's culminated in the disposability of black people. And on the other level at the realm of the episteme or the orders of knowledge, where we have to think about the best way to think ourselves in an anti-black world. In both of these situations, I think that these are the primary tasks of Africana philosophy as a decolonial force and method, is the process by which we engage reality that we know generates the negations of blackness, while at the same time developing positive theories that both explain that phenomena and try to resolve it. Both of these approaches stand outside of the assimilatory ethic um, or perspective that we get with simply trying to introduce and include blackness in systems and theories uh, that do, do not recognize its actual humanity or try to instrumentally adjust its expectations of equality. So thank you. Thank you so much for that talk, Professor Curry. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, you can write in the chat or you can um, put your hand up or something. Um, would, would anyone like, like to go? Um, it was for me a very, a very dense talk full of very important information or, or views. Um, and I, I know already that I'm, I'm going to um, re-listen to this. Um, Any questions? I think Alice has a question. Yeah. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, go for it. Um, I mean, Sruti and I were talking during your talk about this, and this is, I don't know if it's how other people are feeling too, and so that's why I'm broaching it, but. <laughs> I know that Shruti and I are both like flawed by your work um, and have a lot of questions, but kind of wouldn't know where to start necessarily. Can I ask, did you, did you say flawed? Like flawed, yeah. Like, oh, or, flawed, okay. Yeah, like it's, um, <laughs> it's amazing, it's informative and instructful. Okay. Um, or instructive and useful. Um, and also, so as a place to start perhaps, um, while other people figure out how to articulate their questions as well. Um, part of the point of this series has been to try to work, work on some of the issues that you talk about. Um, and I'm obviously white and so don't want to take space when I ask asking questions, so I want to get it going. Um, I also know that you're inspired or were early on inspired, I think, by Bell Hooks, um, which I just heard you mention somewhere. And I'm curious how some of the things- Well, Derek Bell, not Bell Hooks. Really oh, oh, so yeah. I heard Bell and I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> well, if you do have a response to that, um, this in relation to Bell Hooks, but I would also say, I guess my question is going to be fairly open in the sense mm -hmm. of if you are familiar with the work by way like George James or Bell mm -hmm. Hooks, um, how you think your work might relate to what they say and where it might differ. Um, because I'm also aware that some of the reading you gave us um, is by authors we've hosted earlier this term mm -hmm. um, who speak about transformation and social transformation and transformation of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about how we might better, given what you're saying, like a lot of potential strategies are methodologically excluded from philosophy mm -hmm. as it is. Um, 
and we're trying to make change but like how we might go about that from within the university if that's possible how to transform the university to allow that because it feels like you're constantly catering to the categories before you um and there's obviously like long-term and short-term strategies Mm. and your work talks about that talks about a lot of specifics but sometimes people haven't engaged with all those historical specifics that lead to the realities with which we engage and things that you say can be misinterpreted Mm. Um, and that's difficult to juggle um, especially when you have to try and make change to departments that give you limited time to to engage with them. No, I mean, look, that's a very difficult question. Um, Institutions are made to withstand the criticisms of students, right? Because after you're gone in three or four years, they're still there, right? Uh, At a very real level, I think the strategy probably will have to bend towards their interests. Uh, And what I mean by that is, is trying to assimilate into various categories. Uh, But as I tell my class all the time, you know, I think there's a push for decolonization that's very much um, tokenized. And what I mean by that is not that it's disingenuous in the sense they want to bring more voices in, but it's is a selection of the kinds of voices they're willing to entertain. So if you're if you're trying to have a conversation about decolonization and, you know, you want it to be compatible with liberalism or with white feminism, those things present problems because in most anti-colonial or decolonial thought, liberalism and feminism are thought to be violent creations that help colonize the rest of the world, right? So I think it's always going to be a struggle to find the right kind of language to appeal to the interests of various people. Uh, I know, I think once a student reached out to me about organizing a conference and they wanted to do it on black people, but then, it, you know, white feminists said they wanted to do it on women. They wanted to join the two things. Those two things are not the same, right? There are different histories, different experiences. Different groups of men have different experiences from white men. Different groups of, of, of uh, black women, brown women have different experiences from white women. So part of the issue is how do you justify or launch the argument for the conceptual space to do something outside of the, the kind of surveillance of these, of these institutions? Uh, part of that is is that we we certainly have the literature that justifies it, but given that I don't know the culture of the institution, I think it's a slow, slow process, right? I think it's a very slow process, and I think that you have to form, try to find allies. You have to find the kind of strategic investments that various colleges and departments have, right, in getting new people there and getting different professors there, uh, trying to find the right kind of people that are gonna be invested in trying to transform forms of knowledge rather than simply reiterate them. These are these are large conversations that I think it's very difficult to have at the student level, to be honest. Could I follow up with that unless there's another question? Um, there is a question um, from Katerina. Okay. I'll- Uh, she's asked me to read it out so um thanks thanks so much for this fascinating session i'm currently reading um i think it's sakaya um Mm -hmm. sakaya jackson's book becoming human um from this year i was wondering whether you read the book or know her work and what you think of her search for a different mode of being knowing feeling rather than discussing strategies for how to make liberal humanism more inclusive. Yeah, I've read part of the book. Uh, I'm actually writing a review of it. Uh, I think, I mean, I think that's a fine project. Uh, My suspicions are, how do we say that there is a non-being of blackness or a plasticity to ontology, but we utilize gender to kind of ground those things? You know, what I find happening a lot of times in afro pessimist literature is that we make claims that blackness is the slave or blackness does not exist. Uh, but somehow then the tropes of the human, right, that we say blackness is not part of, somehow grounds blackness. So we say black people are not human beings, right? But then we say, but they're gendered. But 
gender is an aspect of the human. So what what delineates certain forms or performances of black bodies that have no existence to make them act in the way of humans that have existence? Um, that's a to me that's a methodological or conceptual point. Um, in terms of how we think more largely about transforming blackness, uh, I think we have to we we have to get out of the reactive force that that question has in disciplines. Everybody right now is asking, well, what do we do to decolonize? And what it's done is it's created a market for people who are not necessarily versed in the intellectual genealogy and history of Black thought to take a political stance about Blackness. And that suffices for expertise and knowledge. Um, I think that if we're making conceptual arguments about Black people, then those concepts have to be answerable or translated into lived experience. In other words, if we say that there is a new notion of the human that we're trying to get to, then that notion of the human needs to be something that explains the realities that, that Black people around the world have been suffering and enduring. It can't simply be a conceptual project for the sake of having an intellectual argument itself. Uh, Afro-pessimism tries to explain the, you know, the, the disproportionate rates of violence and death that Black people suffer compared to whites. And I think that's a useful diagnostic, but that that's not the end-all be-all of being. We're trying to explain a sociological or historical phenomena um, doesn't necessarily entail that that phenomena reflects on what we actually are. It can express a vulnerability, but surely they don't have to always be synonymous. And I think we have to be very skeptical and critical of those types of theories that try to marry the reduction of sociological phenomena or the vulnerability we have to certain sociological phenomena and translate into certain forms of being. Um, th thank you for that, Professor Curry. Um, uh, we've got a question from Bennett, if you'd like to go next. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I had a question just, just since it's come up a few times about Afro-pessimism or sure. Also, but I guess you could say black nihilism, like what Calvin Warren. Um, <laughs> yeah, Calvin's a good friend of mine. I saw him yesterday. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm curious about the relationship between like a nihilist or pessimistic approach to black ontology. Mm -hmm. The relationship between that and action, and the, the the it seems sometimes inoperable with Winter's discussion of like it is. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm just curious. You're, yeah, you're right. <laughs> All right. This is, you know, so I mean, and this is the difference. Like, you know, I, I, I'm teaching Calvin's work next week at Edinburgh, actually. Um, you know, I think Afro pessimism is a great diagnosis, right? It's a diagnostic tool that many, like, I was trained as a critical race theorist. So Derek Bell was a mentor of mine. I'm still really good friends with, you know, Richard and, and, and other critical race theorists. But the reason for that is because I, I believe that racism is permanent. I think when you look at the United States, the way that we construct black blackness, the way that we legislate blackness, the way that we create different democracies of death and dying, so to speak, about blackness, shows us that this is a disposable category of negation. Um, I think Warren and I agree on that aspect, right? We don't see a project where ontology are being, right? So if we take, if we translate being to the you know, what I'm going with with Winter in terms of the human, uh, offers any resources, right? He's going to suggest that because all the human is ontology and Blackness is excluded from it, I'm going to suggest, well, it's because when you look at the cultural construction, the historical construction of the human, um, it's always had certain kind of others, right? So even in Black male studies, my interest is how do we create, why is it that through every society, racialized men become the most distant from the core of the human? Right. So in genocides and war, et cetera, those things seem to have the most neg negation associated with them. Uh, two different accounts, but saying the same thing. I think the difference is, is that where black nihilism asks for a moment of clarity regarding the political. Right. Understanding that you cannot put faith as a, as a conceptual, intellectual and, and diagnostic argument that the political cannot do the kind of work that you want for black liberation. I'm willing to say, well, I completely agree. I don't have to be a nihilist. I just think this is the wrong venue, but there are other ways that we can assume certain positive aspects of philosophy. It doesn't have to go through the political, it doesn't have to reproduce libera uh, liberalism. It could be the expectation of the fall and destruction of civilization, right? Which is what I ultimately think remedies the problem, but you're right, but that's not a programmatic and normative theory, right? But it is still a positive claim about what we can entail for new orders or sets of knowledge, 
right? I think that those are the two different perspectives. If we're speaking about winter specifically, um, I think winter would be skeptical of the pessimistic claim because the way that she form formulates the sociogenic principle is that these are contingent ontic problems, not ontological metaphysical problems, and that we've mistaken ontology as merely the, the determination of a certain ethno class of the human. Right. So I think she thinks there's a little bit more room for phenomenology and subjectivity to do work either as, a, as an active right force in the world, like motivating people to do things or as what it is that we should be studying. The, the Afro pessimist wants to study and diagnose the problem of blackness as non-being, as slave. She wants to operate the consciousness of that we have of ourselves as non-being. So I think those are two slightly different projects. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks, thanks for that answer, Professor Curry. Well, not a problem. I just lucked out. I'm teaching winter for the last two weeks, so she's fresh on my mind. <laughs> um, um, do, do, yeah, do you, Trudy? Yeah. Uh, can I just ask? This is not like I mean, I guess it is related to the topic, but I was wondering um, what your experiences have been. You know, being like you know. Uh, trained as a critical race theorist um mm -hmm. like in america and then coming here within british academia like you know doing your work um right. the networks that exist and like also it's the sort of dominant um like philosophical ideas and theories that people uh, yeah yeah to. um and i was wondering if you could talk about that a bit oh, like, absolutely yeah. uh, it, it's been frustrating <laughs> um, um, you know, it's it's frustrating in the sense that, like, I, I mean, I find the academic culture in the UK much more pleasant than in the United States uh, because there's less identity politics and there's an appreciation for empiricism as a mode of conducting thought. So that fits very well with how a race crit thinks about the world because we're interested in giving analytic or explanatory accounts of kind of social phenomena or sociological phenomena concerning race or other forms of of, uh, of, of disaggregation and, and disproportionate, uh, you know, disadvantage. Um, on the other hand, I find that the UK is very light on the kinds of thinking that motivates certain political outcomes. And what I mean by that is you could have someone say, like, you know, I'm interested in race or I'm interested in the black thought, but they know, like, Du Bois, right? They don't understand, like, they've never read the papers of the American Negro Academy. They don't understand 19th century ethnology. They don't know how this system in the 19th century differs from the 20th century. They don't, you know, so it's, it's, the conversation of how we understand the relationship between things like philosophy and ideology, law and economics, politics and, and secularism or bias, right? Those things are ordered differently in this society. And it's kind of difficult to translate because in America, if you, like I have degrees in like three different fields, right? So I don't have just a degree in philosophy. And it's, and it's strange because here like people just have a degree in philosophy, right? So it means that the kind of interdisciplinary perspectives that you use to understand problems are the different kinds of methodologies that you're interested in to understand various kinds of things don't exist here the same way. Uh, and I think that's been hard to translate at some point. You know, um, The other thing is that there, I think there are fundamentally core assumptions that differ. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, the first semester I was here, they asked me to teach a topics in gender and race class. So I started off with the first class was uh, white women owned slaves. Uh, black men were brutalized by sexual violence and were raped on, on the plantation. Um, then it was like, let's actually read what white suffragettes said and how white suffragism launched imperialism and then how they went from imperialism to start the Klan, right? Like this is all like how white women were developing these kinds of theories in politics. And people were, were I think, shocked because they didn't know the history of white women and gender. So they didn't know the actual relationship between racism and the development of the gender category in the mid 20th century. So it's those kinds of gaps, I think, that produce this, this, this lack of communication, right? Or miscommunication. Because, you know, in this country, I think if very race is de-emphasized. So race is the thing that they're just starting to find out matters. And overwhelmingly the attention has been on gender. But because the attention has been on gender, is given white women and white feminism a kind of intellectual and political status to determine how people are going to view the other forms of oppression. And that's very weird for me because in the United States, white women certainly have disproportionate amounts of power, but they're constantly criticized on the use and the and the and the de-emphasis of race as part of that power. Here, not so much so. 
So here I come in and make the same arguments about white feminism. And they're like shocking, like, oh my God, we didn't know. And I'm, you know, if, in America it's like, okay, well it's Tuesday. We understand that history. So what else are we trying to talk about, right? And that's, and that's the difference, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of starting at a different level of analysis because the, the lack of familiarity around certain kinds of conversations. I'm wondering as well, like, you know, this relates to something else you were saying, but how does that, like, you know, this difference that exists, it seems almost that um, there's a call, like in the UK right now, to decolonize, you know, universities in particular. How mm -hmm. does that sit with this sort of almost negligence of race, um, this, you know, like desire to really not talk about it and to not put emphasis on it, like, you know, in um, any language other than in terms of, you know, increasing, um, like, you know, uh, diversity or inclusivity. Um, like, obviously, like, you know, we talked about the decolonization process of mm. universities being very flawed and being, you know, very much a part of the neoliberal, um, like, marketization. And yet, at the same time, there are people within universities, within mm. these universities that truly do want to, you know, like, I mean, have ethical grounds on, on which they want to, which is why they're calling for decolonization. And Absolutely. This one, and I'm wondering, you know, what you think of that, because obviously what? here in Oxford, we find it, you know, it's it, like, it, it does, there's just so much to say. And sometimes I just feel like the measures being taken or being afforded are really not making a difference at all. And the measures that would make a difference are just, yeah, constantly not even talked about really. But yeah. yeah, well, I mean, look, I honestly think it's a very difficult question. Um, as I said earlier, I think that the call for decolonization has created an academic market. And that means that there's gonna be a rush of people to fill that market with certain forms of specialization um, that may not be as rigorous or as grounded in certain kinds of theories and training that we get in the United States. Um, that being said, it means that you can literally get people who study race that don't have kind of, you know, this this grounding, right? Like, you know, the difference between critical race theory versus Afro-pessimism versus, you know, black studies and all these other paradigms. And I'm not saying that that doesn't mean there are people. I'm just saying it means that at some point you're going to get people declaring expertise to feel that to take advantage of the market. Um, but I, I think what's more insidious about the way the decolonization is being framed is that it's not being determined by black people. It's not being be determined by people of the darker races. It's being determined by a kind of notion of inclusivity and liberalism that is in fact very incompatible with many of the theories that like I just mentioned or discussed today. So you're looking at a system, like if I'm talking about Biko, right, who's extremely distrustful of the non-racialization of liberals in South Africa, or if I'm talking about Hugh P. Newton, uh, these are gonna be vastly different theories and approaches to how we understand a problem than us saying, well, look, let's just increase the, the, the plurality of the voices we hear. A race crit's gonna say, well, you could increase the plurality of voices, but what are the structures that amplify or determine which voices are heard? How are institutions built? Who's managing the institutions? Who holds a disproportionate power? Right? These are like race crit questions. So if, if any of those questions come out where white people say we're including voices, but they're not redistributing the power, the authority, the running and managing of institutions or populations, then you're inevitably reproducing the same kind of racialist problem under another name. Uh, and I find that, that to, that's the approach that many people and many of these universities in the UK are taking up. Uh, we need much more radical notions. And by radical, I don't mean rhetorically radical. I mean radical in terms of structural and systemic uh, change. Uh, who's evaluating professors? Who's recruiting students? What kinds of money and funds are being directed towards making sure diversity and plurality are represented not only at the, the level of you know, phenotype, but in terms of cultural experience, class background, and, and research interest? Uh, you know, these are the questions that, that change how universities look a decade or two later, not the ones that simply try to vie for inclusion. Uh, and I find, again, two things happen here. One is the reduction of Africana philosophy or decolonization uh, to political ideology. So we speak about decolonization as a political motivation rather than an intellectual and conceptual analytic or investigation into the world. Uh, the second thing is to then say that, well, we can decolonize, but we can debate about what decolonization is. Sure, but what does that mean given that you know that you have basically, you know, vacated blackness from UK universities, right? We see different, different representations of, of ethnic and racial plurality that seems to often exclude blackness as from what I've seen in the UK. 
So, you know, disproportionate rates of, of South Asian versus other ethnic groups and practically no black people. Uh, the conversation about anti-blackness has to at some point be had uh, because I think that what ends up happening is you have institutions and a culture of liberalism um, that's willing to view basically all black and brown people as the same. Uh, and because of that, because you don't have a specific notion of how anti-blackness differs or is similar to other forms of discrimination uh, and racialization, there's not an appreciation for the different depth and the different concepts and the different issues that are being explored throughout throughout various populations of scholars. Sorry, I, I swear this is my last question. No, it's um, fine, it's fine. But, um, I was just, I mean, you know, you talk about obviously the, the various different intellectual traditions that underpin understanding mm -hmm race within the academy but also like outside um like you know in like popular discourse i guess um you know i guess the way like you know people like angela davis or bell hooks or like you know mm -hmm. understood in the states um you know there are um figures like that you know paul gilroy Stuart hall like you know a lot of Absolutely. people at birmingham um like you know who worked with Stuart hall I'm wondering how you engage with these theorists and whether you find that their ideas or conceptualizations of race um, differ, um, like, you know, it's because of the geographic positioning, like, you know. I yeah, it's, you know, like, I, I like Stuart Hall and I, I, I like Candy's uh, book, uh, what is it, Rad Black to Radical or Radical to Black, you know. Uh, you know, I, I think those are great texts. And I, I you know, I, I especially like Hall's work. Uh, you know, I read him throughout grad school. Uh, but I think that there's a different, it's certainly a geographic difference, mm -hmm. you know, you know, when we talk about race and racism in the United States, you have very deliberate objects and, you know, enemies, so to speak, right, is, you know, like, I grew up in the South, so I grew up in one of the most economically impoverished and segregated parts of the of the country, you know, the way that I talk about racism is definitely affected by that, the way that I look at racism structurally, the way that I look at the effects that poverty has in terms of epidemiology are, you know, are these different things. Like these things are very deliberate choices I made in the study of racism because there's much more social mobility from Northern black people. So they don't see, they see racism often as something that affects them intellectually, that, that leads to discrimination. And when I look at racism, it's, it's my ability to see the way that racism leads certain people to early death, how people die, how people are neglected, et cetera. So even within our tradition, there are certain geographical boundaries, even in the United States, it's not a one size fits all thing. But here, I just see a very different tone. Like I think if, you know, it's like, I think if you read my work and read, you know, some of the work from Brit, like there, you feel a different emotional energy, you know, <laughs> to, to how we uh, deal with whiteness and white supremacy. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think, I think you know, there's certainly intellectual traditions and scholars here in Britain that I certainly don't want to um, de-emphasize or, you know, take anything away from. But I do think that when you're talking about this kind of core of anti-Blackness, that the reason that American scholarship resonates with a lot of people across the world um, is precisely because of the viciousness and the violence that, that we deal with. And I think that especially even with Black male studies, the reason that it resonates with so many people outside the United States uh, is because you know, it's like you could look at any data, you you see the brutality, you see the public execution, you see what happened to George Floyd, right? We haven't attempted to explain that seriously yet in the United States, uh, but people understand that aspect of it, you know? Uh, and I think that's ultimately what has to happen. I mean, look, you know, every every generation has these kinds of events, right? You know, and and the brutality of it, the the inhumanity of it, you know, pushes people to think differently. And institutions are usually the last ones to actually change unless it's in their benefit. Um, what I'm suggesting is that there is a political aspect to getting decolonization and, you know, different philosophers who do this work seriously at Oxford. Um, however, uh, part of that strategy is also going to be made intellectually. That there has to be, it has to be understood that the intellectual genealogy, the questions, the problems, the authors um, have a kind of conceptual and analytic rigor that stand on their own besides for the interest that white liberals have in introducing this to other white people, right? Um, my work is written towards black and brown folk. That's who I care about. When I was in the United States, people constantly criticized me because they're like, well, you don't, you don't let white people in. 
<laughs> right? You know, they don't see them, your, themselves in your work. And I completely understand that. I'm not hostile to, to white people reading my work, engaging my work. It's just that, that my audience is other oppressed or marginalized people. Uh, so I think that that's something that's going to be on the table here, uh, because I don't think that people have really addressed that question of who are you writing for? I think because the UK is so overwhelmingly white, the assumption is that, well, all people all scholarship, all teaching is directed to white people, right? This is a given because they're the, all the people that are in the ancient universities, right? Um, and I think someone who thinks differently about that question, right? Someone who thinks differently about what's the opportunities that we're creating for black or brown folk to find themselves in the material, to see themselves reflected in the text, to hear themselves speaking to themselves, right? Throughout the pages is a different orientation that many people haven't taken up yet. So I think, I think that's where the difference is. I still have a lot more questions, but I will give other people a chance to speak now. Fair enough. Yeah, does anyone else have a question? Um, Professor Curry, I was wondering um, if there's anything that you'd like to see in the utopia. In the utopia? Mm. I feel like I spend a lot of time for good reason thinking about problems, but what's mm. something that, you know, could be a, a, a good, resolution wow the issues no. you see. given the kind of work i do i very rarely get to think of utopias um you know it's one of those things i mean part of me if i was in the united states i would say a world without whiteness just to try it out right just to see how it would be just to you know test the waters a little bit um you know i i think you know if i could, if i could you know if i had fiat and i could just make something happen i i think it would really be um, understanding the possibilities that Black culture has to create its own world. Like, I really would like to see the world that Black culture could create un uninterrupted. You know, what would it be if history had worked out a different way? And the reason I say that is because, you know, we, we have lots of conversations about what could be and what shouldn't be, et cetera. But wouldn't it be awesome just to have another possible world to see what we could do something with, right? Different values, different different categories, different forms of being. I'd just be excited about the possibility of seeing how that works out. Cool. Um, those, um, a lot of people um, are worried about this for, for good reasons. Do you think perhaps, um, well, so I'm a computer science student. So do you think perhaps um, what's been going on um, with social media and like the plurality of news sources and the breaking down of, um, of what is objective do you think that, in a sense, at least like gives us a sort of gestalt shift for, you know, maybe there can be multiple worlds um, where um, facts don't all look a certain way, that they can still be, you know, justified and reasonable? <laughs> this, is, this is definitely a generation gap between us. Uh, no, no, because I think that you know, social media is still run by the people that I fight about that I think form an objective part of oppression. And, you know, generationally, I understand why millennials think about social media as these possible worlds and different groups and various facts and identities. But in the actual world that controls that, these, the social media platforms are controlled by the capitalists. They're controlled by the neoliberals. They're controlled by the racists. Uh, and what that means, and this has been my criticism of Black Lives Matter, what it means is no matter how radical you think you are on social media, when the, when the you know, rubber meets the road, uh, you're inevitably going to cater to corporations. So you can talk about, you know, Garza, our colors back in the DNC are getting, you know, contracts with Warner Brothers, because the whole plight has been certain groups of Black people who are oppressed and dying, like the people I come from don't get contracts, don't get to have their life stories talked about it, but the people who know and have relationships and networks with NGOs and corporations and people uh, in government uh, get that. So I still have to deal with the problem and the reality knowing that poor Black people from the United States that come from neighborhoods where I come from are still going to die years earlier than every other group of people um, and die poor and be affected and police by, uh, you know, the state, et cetera, uh, while various people who say that they're fighting for people like that uh, get to make tons of money. 
And in the United States, this has always been the process. The process is black people who have audience with white liberals uh, get paid. They become the representatives, people who don't, people who care about victims and poverty and the people who suffer that take stand against the state, they're not popular, right? That's just how American history works. Um, so I think social media reflects this kind of model that we see, you know, coming about because of certain kinds of hashtags, some kinds of political activism, certain kinds of tropes. But in the real world, what motivates legislation is not going to be that. BLM can't claim one legislative victory despite its, its social media activism. Uh, it can't claim a huge decrease in the numbers of Black people killed per year from 2012 or 13 to now. My interest is in the people who are suffering. I don't, I don't care about politics in that way. And I think that the younger generations, and I understand why, um, see social media as this kind of possibility, uh, as this alternative world where we don't have to retreat to the objective or the scientific. But when when you got when you get someone like Trump and he's threatening to cut off internets and when he's running fascist regimes, what then do you appeal to? Because the the politics that you embrace as as the millennial presupposes a level of first world comfort, right? Of the metropole that it cannot be enjoyed by other groups of people across the world. It can't translate into activism in the same way. What I'm suggesting is understanding structures and the relationship manipulation of information that allows them to believe in that kind of fantasy, um, be it based on identity or class or location, but pick, pick your poison, um, has to answer to the brute facts of the world, which ultimately are violence against black and brown folk, period. Cool, thank you. Um, no problem. I, you said, you ended up saying a lot of very interesting things, um, but I do wanna clarify that I'm, I'm not my most articulate today, but I'm, I, I hate social media. I'm not on any of it. No, I wasn't blaming you. I, I was speaking in a general <laughs> so, not, not I mean, you, not you specifically. Up about the topics I wanted you to. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah. Alice Hank, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Unless someone else wants to go, hasn't gone. Oh, yeah. please. Yeah. Um, so a lot of what you have been talking about and the language you've been using um, and I always circle back to this because I study Buddhist philosophy, um, reminds me of the Buddhist philosophy that I study, which is specifically, and I don't know how acquainted you are there, but like Madhyamaka Buddhist philosophy, mm -hmm. which, and I'm using this as a foil to Ashley's question, actually, um, in social media and possible worlds and mm -hmm. thinking about tools that we can use in, within critical pedagogy of social transformation. Mm -hmm. um, and so, Madhyamaka Buddhist philosophy says that its goal is ending suffering for all sentient beings and then it's you know there's praxis in the philosophy which can be meditation and your whole conduct and how you yeah. live um and I have been interested in it in intersection with critical pedagogy and the back radical tradition um so far but I'm looking to explore that more which also has more of an element of praxis than mm -hmm. British analytic philosophy and an education and the dangerous power of education, which we spoke about, um, mm -hmm. or what could be dangerous last week as well with Jane Anna Gordon. Um, but as a foil, the power dynamics are different for meditative practices, which mm -hmm. are kind of thinking of possible worlds and they might be said to be about sensitizing people to the suffering of others that people use that as one of their goals so in thinking about techniques and having a foil that takes away or could take away all technologies but still be involved within this possible world realm and thinking about your work you do a lot of like philological work I would say that brings out realities that people have silenced or um told in different ways mm -hmm that makes the suffering very evident and makes us have to hold ourselves account to the histories with which we're complicit. And so that seems like one technique. Mm -hmm. um, and an irrefutable one, in my view, and, or if you're going to refute it, you have to face exactly yeah, what- you, you gotta put in some work, yes. <laughs> yeah, um, and see how those gaps don't link up. Mm -hmm. What other tools or um, 
or how would we get more tools like that? Because that does seem to, like you said, fit in slots. Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, British analytic philosophy is really into empiricism, but they're yeah. not into, say, anthropology can go either way. And we also asked Chika yeah. Jeff about this. They're not into that. That's specifically excluded. And the use of new words is also specifically excluded. Yes, I noticed that. Yes. Yeah. So what... What do you think? This, you do there? Yeah, <laughs> that's it. I mean, look, this is you know one of the things I hope to do at Edinburgh is to is to build a center that will be a hub for these kinds of questions. Um, but that takes time and it takes training. There, there is a need for new language. There's a need for new concepts and new ways to articulate the kinds of relationships that we see happening, not only in the UK but you know throughout the world. Um, but the UK has become um how should i say um enamored uh with its own purity and and how it approaches certain kinds of problems on uh, the prestige that it has throughout its ancient universities while effective in protecting some forms of knowledge uh also stifle innovation and the problem with that is that it can't keep up to the kinds of relationships that are being shown to drive certain forms of being or disbeing as winter would suggest in the world so one of the strengths, I think, of being in these environments is, is certainly taking advantage of the resources. Um, but one of the disadvantages is there has to be different modes and, and audiences that are willing to branch out and try to invent something new. Now, it depends if you're a pessimist or an optimist. A pessimist would say, well, it's already determined, nothing will change. An optimist would say, well, it could be the breeding grounds of a new kind of renaissance, right? Um, or enlightenment, right? Since I, I guess I should say enlightenment since I'm in Edinburgh. Um, but but uh, regardless, something has to change. And that doesn't mean it's gonna be successful, but I think that over the next two years, as we bring more people here to have discussions about race, uh, specifically some of the people that I brought in um, at Edinburgh, there will be vastly different conversations about anti-blackness here. And there are gonna be vastly different conversations about racialized maleness and, and feminism and gender here. Uh, and some of these are gonna be very uncomfortable, uh, but I think it's gonna open the kind of thinking necessary that will start other people um, willing to break out of some of these modes, right? Um, in terms of creating new term, tools specifically, I mean, tools fit the job. So I think once new problems arise, we're going to have to, you know, fight to, to get certain tools recognized to deal with those problems. You know, but what I, what I would urge against is the idea that we simply mimic what comes over from the United States. Uh, one of the earlier talks that I gave today at Essex was that, you know, we, we've kind of imported you know, the notions of intersectionality over to the UK. And I said, well, look, but, you know, the UK doesn't even have disaggregated data in some places, like Scotland, for instance. So, like, you can't get racial breakdowns of different things. I was like, so how do you know whether or not certain groups operate in the same way they operate in the United States? Because you don't have the data to test it, right? And and people get uncomfortable with that line of reasoning because it's like, true it makes sense right if if the idea is that intersectionality isn't an ontological claim about the state of the world but it's a system to study different things what do you do when you don't have the information to study or analyze something right you have to assume ideologically that it's true and this presents a problem but it also demonstrates how the society is not set up to deal with certain forms of knowledge and language right that it doesn't have an apparatus to talk about racial disparity because it doesn't collect racially disaggregated data you can't talk about racism in that way so the way that we talk about racism often is as class disparity because it's set up to deal with class disparity. So the push, I think, for some of the scholars are, is going to be to introduce the need for the kinds of evidence and the kinds of uh, data that allow us to do that kind of work. And I think at the more analytic level, it's going to ask, well, what kind of concepts do we need as philosophers to understand the reality that's unfolding before us? Um, the UK is not prepared to have a racial consciousness as the basis of philosophical inquiry and activity. Um, but I think this is what these conversations are, in fact, pushing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I liked um, how your, your ideas of, um, of having different um, spaces in the UK than in the US and, and concepts, and particularly having um, discussion spaces. But I was wondering how... Um, what you have in mind sort of for having places to discuss these themes in majority white institutions. Um, Because 
well I know I have to do a lot of explaining a lot of the time and it gets very um draining and and it well it depends who I'm talking to yeah. um well I think listen I think that the issue is and, and I, I've held this position throughout my career um thank you sir or ma'am <laughs> I don't know who Bray Bonfrey me is um uh, I, I think the issue is this is that these are forms of knowledge these are statements and articulations of what black people thought I don't think that changes despite the audience uh I don't adjust what I say for white people any more than I do for any other audience. Oh, and I think that that kind of position is the correct one to stand on, because if, like any other discipline or any other form of knowledge, if academics are truly interested in it, then they should learn it. Um, if I wanted to develop a, spe a specialization in philosophy of mind, I'd have to go read Chalmers, <laughs> right? Uh, I have to go read people that people take to be the representation of the field. Uh, I think this is a similar case, right? Uh, and what and what we've done is we've again made this political we've made this interpersonal we made this an ethical question uh that doesn't appeal to the best intellectual sensibilities of the places we are uh as a as a question of how we deal with people who don't look like us our difference africana philosophy should be obvious right if the question is how do we understand africana thought then oxford should say well who can we hire to study africana thought if the question is how we understand black men, who can we hire? You know, like these are very simple questions that we that we put into practice for everyone else, right? If you wanted a person that does high order logic, you're going to go hire the best person in high order logic. But somehow, when we're talking about blackness, it becomes confusing. We become disoriented. We don't know because the reason we don't know is because we're not interested in the knowledge. We're interested in the body that becomes present when we invite them to the space, and that causes the chaos. Um, yeah, so I think I think that we we can certainly explain, but at the same time, the the effort needs to be well. Here's the work that I'm going to do, right? And I challenge my class with this all the time, because I think that here there's the idea that we're learning a certain set of rhetorics to justify our political position, and what we forget is these have to be the product of knowledge. All right. So in my class, I think when everybody came in, they're excited, like, yeah, we get to talk radical. And then I hit them with the reading list and they're like, oh, this is a lot of reading, you know, because I, I have very American standards for reading, <laughs> which seems to be incompatible <laughs> with the standards they have here. Um, but, you know, they're reading three, three articles, sometimes four a week. Right. Um, so so the idea is that you're doing roughly 60 pages of reading, if not more. Uh, my grad students in the United States used to do three or 400 and have to write an article every week. Um, but, you know, different is a different workload. But the expectation is I expect I expect a mastery of the terms. So the way that, for instance, I run my classes, um, I don't I don't I don't have like a, the British style of lecturing. Right. Where they kind of just sit there and like speak with their eyes or whatnot. I always thought I think culturally that's funny. Um, but like I, my students engage, so I just call on people and I was like, pick up different parts of the question, different parts of the text. What does she mean by sociogeny? Give me a different definition. What's an argument against this? What does Newton say? How does this, you know, that's how my classes are run. So everybody is responsible to knowing the text. And what that's done is it's given people a certain kind of investment in participating and forming knowledge and opinion. People disagree, people debate each other, they dialogue with each other because it's we're, we're building a consensus. I'm training them to understand what the text is saying, what the arguments are saying in real time and not memorization. That's one pedagogical approach to dealing with the work. That if we're trying to develop a competence, if we're trying to develop a way of understanding the world, then we have to in fact enforce that as an intellectual tradition and practice the same way we would any other field. If we keep letting politics and personality intervene into this question, where white liberals who may be good intention, I'm not saying that they're not, but white liberals who, who have a certain investment in decolonization get to decide which black people get to come in and out of the situation based on their own personal comfort, um, then we're ultimately setting ourselves up for disaster. Right. Right. Thank you. Um, Shruti, is there anything else or does anyone else have any questions? I mean, <laughs> go ahead. I don't mind. You can go. 
Oh, no, I mean, honestly, like, I, I think you already answered my question, because one of the things I was going to ask, like, um, about was that it would be very interesting, because, like, obviously, Scotland, very white, I mean, I, I live in Scotland, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, I went to school there, and it was just such a, you know, like, you know, with all of its problems, like, Oxford is surrounded in academic problems, and yet, I feel I have a more radical education here than, like, you know, mm -hmm. I would have ever gotten, and I guess, yeah, that was one of the things I was going to ask is that, you know, what is it like teaching from a very different perspective in a very, mm -hmm. like, uh, institution that is white, like, not only in terms of academic but highness, but also, you know, the student body. Um, and I guess, especially like undergrads. Um, but yeah. yeah, I think you've kind of touched well, on the undergrad, the undergrad piece is a little different because in America, we focus more on our grad students. So I've had lots of successful undergrads that I sent over, you know, off to grad school that have done exceptionally well. But, um, you know, part of the problem, I think, in the U.S. institution is that undergrads understand that they're checking boxes to get their degrees, right? Um, here, it's a little different because they specialize in one subject. So there's a tremendous investment, I think, that people in my honors classes have, not necessarily mastering the material. I think some certainly do, but also in making sure they get high honors through the, you know, to finish out their degrees. Um, and because there's not the same kind of prominence of graduate education here, um, I think the, the, the conceptual research-based investment is different. So in the United States, you always want to be the top, at the top of the research game, right? Because you're having grad students who want to generate a certain level of prestige and funding, et cetera. And that doesn't exist here in the same way. So that's been, it's, it's a cultural shift. You know, like I'm, I'm used to publishing like eight to 10 articles a year. We're, you know, we're doing joint publication. It's not the same kind of research culture. So I'm trying to recalibrate myself to that expectation. You know, um, it's just, yeah, it's just so different. But I think in terms of the students, I think there are better undergraduate students here in the sense that they're, you know, they're more rigorous in a certain way, like they're trained, but then they, they also lack certain skills. Like they don't write argumentative essays in philosophy, right? Which is a staple of how you write in, in America. You know, so, you know, some differences, um, many good, you know, a few disappointments, but, you know, I just think it's a different academic and, and um, university based culture. Yeah. I guess I was wondering more like, you know, a lot of Scottish students, um, there is this idea in Scotland about it being quite an egalitarian society, much more so than England, at least. And I guess, yeah. you know, their ideas of race, um, you know, that comes from these narratives, you know, how that um, or even like, you know, the Scotland's own like political situation now where like, you know, at least there's this idea of it being uh, colonized. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. Strong word that they don't like to use, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> colonized by the um, English, um, mm. you know, like if that ever comes up in the classroom, I mean, these are just very like. I, no, I mean, it's, it's come up, but it's, you know, it's one of those things where I think people are unfamiliar with it. And you know, the most stark example that I could think of is when I, the first semester they put me in the classroom, I basically had a, you know, I'm teaching gender and race, right? And the class is practically all white women. And they didn't know that, you know, the UK was an empire, you know, like they just didn't, it didn't click. So, you know, I'm telling them about all these horrible things that white women did in the colony next to white men. Like, it was just so cold. Like, you could just tell they were just like, I've never heard of something so horrible. Because, you know, they're socialized into this belief that I think that white women are good and innocent and pure and oppressed and they're minorities like anyone else. I'm like, yeah, that's not how that works. Um, I think that was kind of the clearest demonstration of that kind of shock factor. It wasn't really around the question. Well, I, mean, I guess it was around the question of racism, but it wasn't around like Scottish colonialism was about the general idea of the UK as a colony. Uh, but I have to say, though, I, I was I was tremendously impressed with the ability of them to many of the students just to get engaged the reading. You know, for me, it's, you know. For me, I'm, I'm, I'm big into intellectual history and, you know, empirical science. So, you know, I want to theorize about concepts that I can locate in some form of empirical or archival material. And, you know, they responded well. You know, I think for anybody, you know, I think, you know, I think, I think two things happen here. I think being in philosophy and being, a, you know, holding a professorial chair in philosophy is somewhat strange to students who've never seen a Black person as a teacher. Right. So I think that whole experience for them is is alienating because um, they've never had to deal with a black person in a position of authority in that way. Um, I think, on the other hand, the material that I do is also culturally alienating because they've never been asked to think about the world 
from the perspective of black people. And even if you think about it in the most generous liberal, you know, kind of etiquette that, well, we think everyone's equal. You never heard black people describe what they think you are. And that's a very different experience, I think, than white people have. Um, you know, but I think black and brown folk in the UK, every time I talk to them, they get it, right? They get this, this need, even though it's supposed to be equal, they get that racism exists. They get that they're not the ones in charge. You know, and, it's, and that's why I think it's so funny. Like when I got off the plane, white people were like, oh, this is not like America. You'll be happy here, da, 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 da. You know, I go to a movie theater, you know, I was doing a commentary on uh, the barbershop. It was playing down at the, you know, uh, Edinburgh uh, Theater. And a white woman was like, oh, shouldn't you be up on stage, you know, dancing with the other performers, right? Now I'm the only black person in the audience that's not a performer. And I was like, okay. So I went back to my wife and I was like, you know, a white woman got me today because I wasn't prepared. You know, if I was in America, you kind of have this, you always know that white people are going to say something racist. It's part of the culture. You're racially charged. You're always on, you know, on guard. I, you know, I was in Scotland for two, for a month or two, thought, hey, you know, I'm going to just let these white Scottish people, they want to be equal, will embrace tolerance for a moment. And it got blindsided, right? And, and you know, it, it wasn't the most horrible thing I've ever been called, but what it what it demonstrates to me though is that the kinds of insults and microaggressions that I experience in the United States you also see here, right? The idea is that Scotland as a white country is beyond race and beyond bias is just not true. And I think that there's a different culture because people here are extremely polite, right? There's not a in America there's this kind of individual aggressiveness towards black people that I don't necessarily think exists here. But there are institutional aspects of racism and anti-blackness that I see throughout institutions. And I think that that has to be both dealt with um, and engaged seriously. Right. Hey, thank you so much. Um, I, I have more thoughts than that, um, but because, yeah, th this whole thing has been so enlightening. And um, well, thank yeah, you. I, I, we're all very, very honored to have you here, um, Professor oh. Curry. I, I appreciate the invitation. Um, so yeah, it is 6.30. Um, thank, thank you all for coming. Um, we'll be here again next week. Um, was there an event at LMH that you wanted to bring up? Um, there is um, an event at LMH. I don't have the information right now, but I can pull it up. Um, Another philosopher, Justin, who's involved with Liminality and Map, has put on a series, um, like a back cultural series, um, through LMH. And this is a spoken word event with a poet from the Caribbean. And it's crossed over with our timing a little, but he said it's fine for people to um, go late. And if you want the information, because I don't have it pulled up right now, because I'm going to head over there, um, I can send it to you as well but it's also Facebook searchable or if you get the OPP or put newsletters we've linked it on there um so that that is that no problem Lee okay thank you um Judy do you want to stop the recording oh